tonight, the billionaire businessman and his family attacked in their country mansion. I went to grab the crowbar and he just smashed it down on my head. Their home was stormed by a gang who used brutal violence to subdue their terrified victims. Will you be able to name the men behind the masks? Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We're going to have more on that violent burglary at the house of the Phones for You founder, John Caldwell, very soon. But first, let's take a look at some of the other cases that you can help with tonight. We have a studio full of detectives just ready to take your calls. They urgently want to know who raped a young girl on her way home from school in Sheffield, as of course does her mother. She'd got no coping mechanism for that sort of attack. She's a child. Absolutely dreadful. They also need to know who threw the punch that killed 48-year-old father of two, Adrian Milner, as he walked home from a festive drink in Kent in December. Adrian's brother is at a loss as to why someone would do such a thing. I, I just can't comprehend that he should have died for that reason, for taking one punch in the face and it's just a complete waste of a life. We also have remarkable news on some of the cases that we've featured recently, including the million pound Stradivarius stolen from a London railway station and a conviction for the thug who floored a young woman in Burton-on-Trent. And Rav is here with his gallery of wanted faces and his roundup of CCTV. Rav. Yep, sure am. Uh, tonight we've got people wanted for murder, robbery and fraud. Plus, this pub landlord might have an unusual taste in fashion, but he certainly didn't deserve to be beaten unconscious. So can you name the men responsible? And Matthew has something very special for us tonight. Yes, we have the exclusive inside story of how detectives finally caught the man dubbed the Night Stalker. He's 53-year-old Delroy Grant, and last week he was convicted of dozens of offences against the elderly, including rape and burglary. Officers now believe he may be responsible for hundreds of attacks. The trial was the culmination of an enormous 17-year investigation, the largest in the Metropolitan Police's history. received a phone call at two in the morning to tell me that we'd finally apprehended the man that I'd personally been waiting eight years uh, to, to meet. Despite some serious policing mistakes along the way, Grant was eventually captured during a massive undercover surveillance operation. Well, with unique access to the Met's investigation, we'll reveal how they finally tracked down the infamous Night Stalker. Now, John Caldwell is one of Britain's best known and indeed wealthiest entrepreneurs. He founded an enormously successful chain of mobile phone stores and he's renowned for being, well, a bit of a toughie in business. In many ways, he, his partner Claire and young son are very fortunate. They live a privileged life in a beautiful country mansion. But when you see what happened to John and his family one night back in November, it's clear that no matter how many millions you've got in the bank, being brutally attacked in your own home has a devastating effect. This house is a home. For somebody who first visits, it may look like a stately home, a show home, but in actual fact, it's a real home. It's been a, a huge... Um labour of love, really, because the home is so old and such a lot of restoration to be done. So there's a huge amount of our personalities and characters in the home. John Cordwell started life with nothing, but became one of the UK's best-known entrepreneurs. Over a decade ago, his success enabled him and his family to move here to their dream home in rural Staffordshire. <laughs> So how was school? Is it okay? Have a nice day. 
The 1st of November last year had been like any other day. Claire and the family's au pair, Sophie, had done the school run and returned to the house. You got your teddy? At around 7 p.m., Sophie put the couple's son to bed and went to her room. We were just settling down after supper. I was flicking through a magazine, nothing in particular, when they burst in on us. Get on the floor! Get on the floor! Get on the floor! Get on the floor! Oh, no! The way they attacked so quickly gave us no speed of reaction at all. Uh, I saw the second man with the crowbar. I went to grab the crowbar and he just smashed it down on my head. No! My head was just ringing, I could see stars. I was sort of on the point of semi-consciousness, but still OK. Get on the floor! Get on the floor! Oh, God! Get down! Oh, <laughs> There's just blood everywhere. I mean, I'm not medical. I don't know how much blood you can lose from the head before it's dangerous. So I was pretty frantic, hysterical, um, thinking, how long is this going to last for? And, you know, John needs medical attention, you know, as soon as possible. I said, calm down. <laughs> the gang then began to question Claire about who else was in the house, forcing her to reveal that the au pair Sophie was upstairs in her room. Hey, come on, you're calling it on. Where? <laughs> it's all right, it's okay, it's all right. Well, no one's gonna get here, it's okay. But the family's nightmare was only just beginning. With John and the au pair handcuffed in the kitchen, the armed attackers would now force Claire to open the family safe. Don't mess us about. I'm not, I'm not. Come I'll show on, you now. OK. Right, oh. just put the number in. Uh, open the safe. Uh, just open I the safe! I can't Come remember on, the number. I can't remember the number. I couldn't think of the number to, to begin with. I was so nervous, I was shaking. I was confused, I was, you know, worried about what, what they were going to do next. Stop messing oh. us about and open it! I did, did the combination and opened the safe and they emptied all of what they saw. There was cash, there was jewellery. They said, now take us to the other safe. And I said, there isn't another safe. And they got, he got more threatening and louder. And he said, take us to the safe. And he threatened me and my son. Your son's in bed upstairs, isn't he? Yes. I know there's another safe. Don't mess me about. But I'll pay him a visit. Claire was so petrified of what they'd do to her son, she felt she had to admit that there was a second safe. What's the number to the safe? <laughs> Come on, let's make it quick. Come on. Okay. Don't mess us about anymore. What's the number to the safe? We didn't want them getting out of the house quickly because we had managed to set off an alarm. So all the time we were hoping that the police would arrive. Stop messing us about what's the number! The balance that was going on in my mind was how much can I delay them without uh, bringing serious injury to Claire or the other people in the house, which was my son and, uh, and the au pair. So I did eventually give them the number. And at this time, they were obviously successful. They got in the safe, took everything. Stay there. And then one guy said to the other, blue lights, blue lights. So they went to run. Right, okay. And one of them said, bring her with you. So he went to grab me. I fortunately managed to wriggle free. And obviously they were then at the point where they just got to run. So he didn't stop to come back for me. And we've got another stairway in the house. So I ran down the back stairway and hid in a bedroom. John Clare watched from the window as the gang escaped. At that point, there must have been tremendous relief that you'd, you'd actually survived. There was. There was a huge relief of survival. But, of course, I was still worried about Clare. I didn't know what had happened to her. As soon as I found out that Clare was OK, then it gave way to frustration and anger. 
Yeah, because the, the police actually know that they were on the property itself, they were watching, they were planning, they were just working out the whole layout, weren't they? Yeah, that could have been happening for days or months. We just don't know. What we do know from the amount of information that the crooks had was that there was serious surveillance had been taking place of our lives. And, f and what does that feel like? <laughs> I mean, it's a dreadful thought because it just means anybody can watch you at any time. Nothing will be the same again. The fact that I'll never replace the sentimental items, but also, you know, being free and easy in a home um, where, you know, where, where once we didn't have to have any security other than, you know, normal alarm systems. And now, you know, I don't feel safe alone in the house. They're probably going to almost certainly do it again. And who knows what's going to happen next time. Next time, it might be some somebody who is who is killed. Really shocking. Well, I'm joined by Detective Inspector Tim Martin from Staffordshire Police, who's here with his team tonight. Thanks for joining us. The level of violence here was quite profound. A horrifying attack. Yes, as you saw in the film, um, John suffered a serious head injury as a result of the attack with the crowbar. Luckily, he's a very fit and healthy man. He's now made a full recovery. But nevertheless, it was a terrifying attack for the family and now they've drastically increased security around the premises. Uh, one of the other things that John said that was, that was terrifying was that, you know, they had been watched, he thinks, for quite some time because this was a very well-planned attack. Yeah, undoubtedly. These people have done their research. Um, they've watched the house, they've monitored the movements of the occupants. They knew what they wanted, they knew where to find it, and that's particularly disturbing for the family. Tim, let's talk about what it was they wanted, because very, very high value, but also pretty distinctive, some of it. Take, take us through. Yeah, they got away with uh, a large amount of jewellery and cash, a substantial value. Some of the watches and the jewellery are very distinctive items. Now, let's talk about this necklace. People are just seeing it just a second ago, because this is not something, even if you want to spend a lot of money in a shop, you couldn't buy this because it's a bespoke piece of jewellery, very distinctive. It's, it's very distinctive. It's a custom-made piece of jewellery, and I'm appealing to anybody who's seen this item to come forward. Right, so who else are you appealing to this evening, then? I'd appeal to anybody with any information surrounding this burglary. It was very, you know, well-planned. Um, professionally executed and it involved a large number of people. Those people may have spoken to associates, relatives, friends and asked any of them to come forward. They've demonstrated that they're willing to use violence and I want to catch them before anyone else gets hurt or maybe even killed. Yeah, I mean, threats against the little boy were horrible. There, there is, we should remind people, a reward here. There is currently a reward of £50,000 for information leading to a conviction. OK, that's a hefty sum. Tim, thanks very much for joining us. Well, as you've seen, these men clearly need to be caught, or they'll do it again. If you've got any information that you think might help, I would urge you to call now. You know the number, 0500 600 600, or you could call the independent charity, Crime Stoppers, and do that anonymously. Here's their numbers, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Now here's Rav with his first batch of wanted faces. And first up tonight is this guy, Mohammed Ali Edge. Now, you may recognise him as he was on my board last September with police wanting to speak to him in connection with the murder of 17-year-old Amir Siddiqui. Amir was stabbed to death on the doorstep of his family home in Cardiff almost a year ago. Unfortunately, Edge still hasn't been found, but somebody did recently send him some interesting information via the Crime Watch website. Officers tonight are urging this person or anyone who knows where Edge might be to get in touch. If you do see him, don't approach as he's considered dangerous. Just call the police immediately. Next on the board is Kieran Alexandra Rhodes. The 32-year-old is wanted in connection with the supply of more than 10,000 ecstasy tablets in Hertfordshire last December. Rhodes, who also uses the first names of Dylan Falcon, has connections with Hereford, Mid Wales, Sussex and London. Number three here is Dean James Rees, and the 34-year-old is wanted in connection with two robberies in Liverpool where the victims were forced to withdraw several hundred pounds from cash machines whilst being threatened with knives. Rees has connections with the Kirby area of Merseyside, Dublin, and the Spanish resort of Lanzarote, and may be working as a handyman. And lastly for now is this lady. This is Anjali Sharma, although police aren't convinced that's her real name at all. She's previously used a number of others, including Joanne Sarah Peer and Nadia Ali. She's wanted for defrauding a number of high street banks to obtain mortgages worth more than £15 million. She's known to have links in London and Scotland and may even have had facial plastic surgery to avoid arrest. Now, all of tonight's faces are on the website, which is bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. And if you know where any of them are, please tell us 0500 600 600. Or, of course, you can text us 63399. And it's just crime, space, and then your message. Really important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Now, our next case is a rape. 
It's the rape of a 14-year-old girl attacked as she made her way home from school in the Fox Hill area of Sheffield. The man who did this needs to be caught before he tries it again. Hill is a small friendly community on the northern edge of Sheffield but for one family that would all change on one day last November. BBC Radio Sheffield. A very mild but a very windy day today and we are going to... Right! Going to be late for school! Um, here. Have you seen my homework mum? Uh, thanks. Is this it? Yes. Did you finish it? Yeah, it's all finished, Mum. What subjects have then? Uh, maths today. Right. Are we coming back with tonight then? Billy, but I'm not sure if he's got football or not. All right. All right then. See you later, Mum. I'll see you then. Bye, Mum. She is lovely. She's a character. Bit of cheekiness thrown in and. Very playful, affectionate and funny and everybody who meets her loves her. And she's little, she's always been small but big on character. She's, she were happy to walk home, it was only, you know, 15, 20 minutes. She'd walk home from school with her friends. One friend in particular lives on the next street and she took to walking home with him. You know, there's a couple of different routes that they can take, uh, which is why sometimes why she did take the shortcut that she took that day. If you scream, I'll punch you in the face. In broad daylight, and in this very public place, the man then subjected the young girl to a terrifying sexual assault. She was raped and left in the woods. I'm sorry. This guy, he made me do it. He said he was going to stab me. The offender then ran down this hill towards a housing estate below. This makes me certain that he knows the area well and had somewhere to escape to. She was shaking and devastated and tears in her eyes. And I could tell how frightened and hurt she was. She'd got no coping mechanism for that sort of attack. She's a child. She's not at that stage where she should have to deal with any of this. And she's struggling to understand why. Someone within this community knows the offender. For the sake of this poor girl and her family, I need his name. It's as though someone's just put a stop on, on happiness and said, no, you, you'll have to wait for that now. Um, which is why we want the right result more than anything. She's a child and she's struggling to understand why, her mother says. Well, I'm joined now by DCI Philip Etheridge, who's leading the team. Thanks for joining us. Um, we should point out to people, the actress that we used in that reconstruction looks much, much older than the schoolgirl that this happened to. Yeah, that's right. The victim, the victim in this is very young. The offender would have known that and has picked on her because she's vulnerable and obviously looks like a child. If there's any good news here, it's that you've got DNA. Yeah, we've already eliminated 80 uh, local people uh, from this inquiry by then providing voluntary DNA samples. Because I've got a DNA sample of the offender, I can easily eliminate anyone who's innocent in this. Yeah, that's really important. 
uh, part of this whole jigsaw. Uh, let's look, uh, first of all, then, about the area around. Do you think this guy's local to the area? I feel he's got to be local. Uh, this, this shortcut that, uh, that he took uh, would only be known to, to, the, to an offender in that locality. The very fact he escaped onto Edgewall Crescent would, it, would again be someone that would know that locality. For me, he's either visiting that locality, right. he's lived in that locality, or perhaps he's parked his vehicle in that locality. Okay. Now, this brave young girl, despite what she went through, gave you a good ethos. Give us the description. Yeah, the ethos, uh, which you can see in front of you, uh, is we're looking for an 18-year-old man with a spotty complexion who spoke in a local accent. Uh, and she, the victim described her as having a musty smell. In addition to that, he's wearing what is a blue hoodie. Uh, more specifically, the blue hoodie had white writing across the front. OK. And she's, just, she's also described it as having pockets to the front. OK, so that's a couple of distinctive things about it that, that might just nudge somebody's memory. Really interesting too, Phil, that he spoke to her quite a lot throughout this horrific ordeal. He, he, he did. He, he spoke to her. He threatened to, uh, uh, to assault her if, if, uh, if, if she didn't comply. And then afterwards, after the rape had finished, uh, he actually apologised. From, from inquiries that we've made into, in, into his behaviour, this gives me the, the belief uh, that he's seeking intimacy from the victim. Right. And in normal circumstances, this could have been a, norm, a normal caring individual. Yes, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because if people are watching and they're thinking all the descriptions fit somebody they know, but they're thinking, well, actually, he seems like quite a nice young guy, that could be... The, the important part is that they put this name forward and then the DNA will discount the nice young guy. It will, it will. OK, thanks for now, Phil. So, we know this guy has got to be caught, and caught fast. If you know anything, please, I would urge you to rem remember what this young girl went through and to call the number. It's 0500 600 600. If you've been a victim of crime, there is always the victim support line. Let me give you their number. There it is, 0845 30 30 900. Now it's over to Rav with some criminals caught on camera. Yep, and as you can see from this, Christmas isn't always a time for goodwill. inside an upmarket farm shop in Herefordshire in December. Now this man in a natty hat is out for a bit of Christmas shopping, or should that be Christmas stealing? He's certainly dressed for the season, nice warm hat, scarf, and uh, latex gloves. And ingeniously, he seems to be using a festive song to help him remember all the gifts he needs. Now how many gold rings was it? That's one, and two, three, four, and now five gold rings. And not any old rings either. They're the finest Welsh gold and worth more than five grand. Before he leaves, he glances round to make sure no one has spied him. Or maybe he's just looking for a partridge in a pear tree. If you know this festive fugitive, don't keep it under your hat. Go on, give us a ring tonight. Carrying on with the seasonal theme now, but this New Year revelry in the Tor Abbey Inn in Torquay is about to turn from festivities to festivities. The pub landlord, dressed as a French maid, is set upon by two men after a row over the karaoke. But what starts off looking comical soon becomes far more serious. The attacker in the cream top punches, elbows and even tries to bite the victim eventually knocking him out after stamping on his face. It was mindless violence. Make it your resolution to name these New Year thugs tonight. Right, if you want another look, they're online, bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. And if you know any of them, please give us a call, 0500 600 600. Or you can text us on 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. Now, Matthew and Rav have got some interesting news on some past cases. Yeah, and we start with an appeal from our last programme. You may remember the young woman who was raped in Manchester city centre in October. She just said goodbye to the friend she'd been out with that evening, was on the way to meet her boyfriend when she was attacked. Well, just hours after the programme aired, a 26-year-old man from the city was arrested and subsequently charged in connection with the attack. We will, of course, keep you updated on how that progresses. And now a case that we featured in December 2009. This shocking CCTV shows a brawl in a notorious alleyway in Burton-on-Trent in July 2009, during which a woman was punched so hard she was lifted off her feet. Well, thanks to calls from Crime Watch viewers, the attacker was identified as 26-year-old Ramiz Khan from Oldbury, and earlier this month he was sentenced to 21 months in prison after admitting actual bodily harm. Three other men involved in the incident were also imprisoned after admitting a fray. Nice one. 
Next, an appeal we featured in December. Officers wanted your help in identifying a man in connection with the theft of a very rare Stradivarius violin, which was stolen at Euston Station from its owner, the world-famous musician Min Jin Kim. Well, thanks to your calls, 30-year-old John Morn from Tottenham in London was identified, and last month he admitted theft. He's due to be sentenced next week, but sadly the violin, which was worth more than 1.2 million, still hasn't been found. The reward for its return is now £30,000, so if you have any information about where it is, do call the usual number 0500 600 600. Right, still to come, the father of two killed with a single punch as he made his way home from his local pub in Kent in December. Adrian Milner's partner just can't understand why someone would want to hurt such a well-liked man. I feel cheated, if, if that's the right word to use, cheated that someone would, would take him away when he made so many people so happy. And we've got that exclusive look at how police finally caught Britain's most prolific sex attacker, the man known as the Night Stalker. Uh, the media named him uh, the Night Stalker, and that very simply because uh, late at night he would be creeping around the houses and back gardens uh, of homes in South East London and breaking into those occupied by single elderly people. So that's later. And uh, take a look at these rare vintage guitars. They're almost identical to part of a collection worth over a million quid stolen five years ago. We need your help to find the instruments that are still missing. But before all of that, Matthew and Rav have got the latest on what's been happening on the phones so far tonight. Well, let's start with that violent burglary in Staffordshire, the attack on John Caldwell and his family in their own home. Tim and his team are here. What's come in, Tim, so far? We've already had a large number of calls come in, some of which have mentioned names. Of course, I would appeal for more names to come forward. It was a well-planned attack, um, and obviously, in order to do that, they've done the research and they've spent some time in the area. It, it was well-planned, it was violent, and they took specific things, which... Any call on the jury? We're waiting for more calls on the jury, and obviously these are specific bespoke items which will be difficult to pass on. So any calls in relation to the jury, I'm, I'm really after. OK, Tim, good luck with that. Rav. Just got time to give you a quick update on the uh, Sheffield rape of the 14-year-old with Phil Everidge, the DCI, involved in that. Now, you've got some calls already that have come through. That's right, we've had three calls so far, two actually as the, as the show went out. Uh, two names have been given to us, uh, two of the calls relate to the same name. One of the calls has come from an ex-police officer, so we're currently researching all those names that we've been provided with. Brilliant. More coming in all the time. And, of course, any names are important to you because you can eliminate them straight away, can't That's you? correct, yeah. Any name, any name we can eliminate. Good luck with the rest of the pill. Thanks, Thank Phil. You. Thank Kirsty. Thanks, Rav. Now, a week ago today, this man, 53-year-old Delroy Grant, was found guilty of a series of violent sex attacks on the elderly. His campaign of terror lasted for almost two decades, and officers believe he may be responsible for many, many more crimes, perhaps hundreds, all in and around the Surrey and southeast of London. Well, many of his victims noticed how softly spoken he was and how obsessively he seemed to cover up his mouth. The reasons why would only become clear once he was in custody. Matthew has this exclusive story of how police finally caught the Night Stalker. For nearly two decades, this man terrorised the elderly residents of South East London, silently breaking into their homes to rob and sexually assault them in terrifying attacks that could last for hours. The media named him uh, the Night Stalker, and that very simply because uh, late at night he would be creeping around the houses and back gardens uh, of homes in South East London and breaking into those occupied by single elderly people. What followed would become one of the largest and most controversial investigations this country has ever seen. But it would take 17 years of gruelling detective work before they finally caught their man. He was Delroy Grant, a married father of 10 who last week was found guilty of 29 counts of indecently assaulting, raping and robbing pensioners. The actual number of victims is thought to be much higher. We have 203 offences linked by the time of his arrest, but the truth is there are probably more victims who firstly never came forward and secondly, if they did, they would not always tell us the full extent of the crimes they suffered. This is the story of how detectives 
unmasked Britain's most prolific sex attacker and finally caught the Night Stalker. I became the senior investigating officer, or SIO, in 2001. My first impressions were uh, quite daunting. By the time I arrived, there were 73 offences already linked by a variety of methods. All of the offences that we're talking about are in um, the distinct areas of south-east London uh, and just over the border into Surrey. The Night Stalker had first come onto the police's radar in 1992 when he brutally raped an 89-year-old woman at a home in Shirley in south-east London. DNA was recovered from the scene, but no match was found on the National DNA Database. Then, six years later, he struck again, attempting to rape another elderly woman, this time in Wallingham in Surrey, just seven miles from his first attack. DNA from the second assault confirmed that police had a serial sexual predator on their hands. A special investigation was set up called Operation Minstead. His MO was extremely unique. It was almost like his signature. He would attack the house uh, normally by removing a window in one piece, very careful and meticulous in this approach. Once inside or just outside, he would target the electricity by turning it off at the mains and removing fuses. He would cut the telephone wire. He would then go around the house, unscrewing light bulbs, and eventually, and quite unlike most burglars, he would then go and interact with the elderly victim. The victims would only realize there was someone in their home when they were woken in their beds by a blinding torch shining in their faces. They were then put through terrifying ordeals, which could last for several hours. We found potential victims that were sleeping during the day so that they could stay awake at night and be aware and respond to any noise that they feared may be him. <laughs> for someone to prey on the elderly and for them not to have peace and comfort in the latter years of their life, just horrendous. The first challenge detectives faced was to identify potential suspects. If I put you in the position of a victim, you're in your 80s and you're in your bed, you're safe, and you're woken in the middle of the night by a hand over your mouth, and immediately there will be a demand for sex. You reach for the light to turn, to turn it on, and nothing happens because he's already disabled the electrics. He shines a torch in your eyes and he's wearing a balaclava. You're petrified, and I'm going to ask you now, describe him to me. It's impossible, you just can't. With only a vague description of a black male aged between 35 and 45 from southeast London to go on, detectives called on behavioural profilers to help piece together a picture of who this man could be. The way he behaved inside the victim's homes was very revealing. It was clear he had experience with the elderly from the way he supported and lifted his victims, leading profilers to believe he'd worked as a carer or in an elderly care home. And in order to creep about without arousing suspicion, it was suggested he worked at night. Good morning. Not a late one last night, was it? Yeah, it was a bit. Oh, I see you later. Good day. Bye, Bye. see ya. And there was something else that was bothering Detective Superintendent Morgan, the lengths this man was going to to hide his face. For me, it was a potential that there was something different about his face, something readily identifiable about his facial features. The problem was we didn't know exactly what that was. By 1999, the frequency and severity of the attacks had escalated. In August of that year, he carried out his most violent attack yet, raping an 89-year-old woman. Twice. The assault was so brutal, the victim was left fighting for her life. It's very impactive. Um, it, it, it's very sad, and uh, you know, uh, we needed no more motivation to find this man. But police were still struggling to narrow down their pool of 16,000 potential suspects. So they turned to the public for help. 
massive investigation has been launched by police in London to catch a man responsible for a series of sex attacks on elderly women. The appeal had unexpected results. They stopped him. It's as simple as that. He followed the press and what was being said about him, and he would stop offending. And for three years it worked, but in 2002 he surfaced again, indecently assaulting an elderly woman in the same area of London where he'd attacked his first victim ten years earlier. So instead of another appeal, a large-scale surveillance operation was set up involving over a hundred police officers. Surveillance teams waited for the attacker to walk into their trap. During the sixth week of the operation, a violent burglary took place, which bore all the hallmarks of having been committed by the Night Stalker. But frustratingly for police, it was a mile outside of their surveillance cordon. Absolutely devastated. We've invested um, uh, an immense amount of uh, proactive resources to covering a favoured area, and he switches to an area that he'd never been at before. Operation Minstead. But detectives were undeterred. The one thing we knew that we definitely had 100% was this man's DNA. So we approached this with a view to keeping up with the developing world of science. In 2003, another Metropolitan Police investigation had used a pioneering scientific technique called ancestral DNA profiling to identify the ethnicity of a headless torso which had been found floating in the River Thames. If they could apply the same technique to the Night Stalker's DNA, they would have a far more accurate picture of his ethnic background. The DNA samples were sent to America, where scientists got to work. Two weeks later, they had a result. What it told us from the analysis of his DNA is that his ancestry is from the Caribbean. Now, this enabled us to rule out anyone that was solely of African ancestry or anyone who had a white parent or grandparent. Within just a few weeks, the number of potential suspects had been drastically reduced. The fact that we removed several thousand, literally overnight, really boosted morale. We really thought we were getting closer to him. By 2007, Detectives could see that the offender's behaviour was changing. The motivation appeared to be mainly for money. It was clear that the level of um, precautions that he had been taking in the planning of the offences was reducing. He was becoming greedy. Once again, surveillance teams were set up all over Shirley in south-east London. Then, on the 29th of October 2009, a man matching the offender's description was caught on CCTV running to a car from the scene of a nearby burglary. I looked at the picture and you could barely make out a, a blurry image of a vehicle. It meant nothing to me, so we engaged a expert who immediately told us the make and model of the vehicle. It was a Vauxhall Severa B model, 2005 to 2009. After nearly two decades, they felt they were closer than ever to finally catching the culprit. 17 days later, on a cold November night, one of the surveillance teams noticed a similar Vauxhall Sephira parked on a residential road in Shirley. We have a grey Vauxhall Sephira parked on the road, over. Then, an hour later, a man was spotted running to the car. Officers sprung into action. Police, get out of your car, do it now! Show me your hands! Get down! I received a phone call at two in the morning to tell me that we'd finally apprehended the man that I'd personally been waiting eight years uh, to, to meet. 
That man was 52-year-old married father of 10, Delroy Grant. At the station, Grant denied all knowledge of his crimes, speaking only to confirm his personal details. OK, what's your first name, please? Delroy. But detectives were confident they had their man. He matched very accurately what we thought we knew about him. He is a primary carer for his disabled wife who has multiple sclerosis. He has a history of working in old people's homes. We know that he was out working at night, often as a minicab driver. West Croydon. His family and friends that we've spoken to are absolutely shocked that this is him. Um, he was outwardly Mr Ordinary. He clearly lived two lives and he kept his two lives separate. Nobody knew he was the man that was out raping uh, the elderly. And there was more. Well, I went straight into work uh, and went down to the custody suite to meet him. Uh, clearly, I've waited a long time for that moment. I also wanted to know what was the reason why he had taken such precaution to hide his face from the victims. He has no front teeth and he doesn't wear dentures. And that would have been something that if a victim had noted, um, we would have probably and highly likely caught him a lot earlier. Samples of Grant's DNA were taken and rushed to the Forensic Science Service for analysis. Eight hours later, Detective Superintendent Morgan got the call. Excellent. Thanks. He was a one-in-a-billion match. Uh, it was him. This month, Grant stood trial at Woolwich Crown Court. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, he pleaded not guilty. His defence in court was that his wife from the 1970s had stored uh, various samples of his body fluids and over the subsequent 31-year period, out of malice, had um, deposited them at the scenes of crime. Um, quite frankly, a ludicrous um, defence and if it wasn't so sad, it would be laughable. The jury found Grant guilty of all charges. He was given a life sentence and ordered to serve a minimum of 27 years. Personally, I've waited 10 years for this verdict. For years, many of his victims, all they wanted to know was who was he and why did he attack them? Sadly, most of them have gone to their graves not knowing the answers to those questions. His victims have shown courage and strength when faced with the most frightening of situations. These are traits that Delroy Grant does not possess. He is now rightly where he belongs. The elderly, the vulnerable, it's beyond horror, that, really. Yeah, it doesn't get much worse. These were frail pensioners, often blind or deaf, with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's that he deliberately targeted. The judge told him, your utter depravity knows no bounds. You left a trail of distress, fear and misery. From Delroy Grant, no explanation, absolutely no remorse. Quite the opposite. You heard that defence about yeah. his ex-wife. I mean, it was preposterous. Um, there's no doubt about it, he should have been caught earlier. Yes, in 1999, he was spotted acting suspiciously near one of the burglaries. Someone phoned in his car registration, and that gave police a name, Delroy Grant, but they investigated the wrong Delroy Grant. They took his DNA, it didn't match, and so that name was ruled out of the police inquiries. They did go round to the right Delroy Grant's house, but he was out and they didn't go back. The Independent Police Complaints Commission described it as a simple misunderstanding that had horrific consequences because Grant committed at least another 146 attacks and after the trial, the police publicly apologised for that mistake. Uh, it was a, a massive police operation in terms of the logistics of it, the span of it. It was massive with some blind alleys as well, like whether he used a motorbike to get to the crimes. The police put out this e-fit at the time. But in the end, it was a return to that strategy of focusing on the robberies that was the absolute key. When they caught Grant, his car was packed with all of the paraphernalia for the break-ins, which had spiked in 2008 because he'd gone into severe financial difficulties. And so they reset that surveillance trap. 
Uh, and can it be right, possibly hundreds more victims, briefly? Yeah. 203 linked to him. The police say it will be more. One woman told police that her mum had told the police about the burglary but just couldn't bring herself to say that she'd been raped as well. And she died before Grant was caught. And tragically, so many of the victims did. I mean, from beginning to end, this is a horrific story with only one redeeming feature, that he's been caught and probably will never get out of prison. Thanks, Matthew. Now, Rav has got more of his wanted faces, Rav. And we start with Stanislav Glischinski. And police want to speak to the 30-year-old Pole in connection with the murder of a Lithuanian man in Newport in Gwent earlier this month. The victim was badly beaten before being set alight. Glischinski, who has links to London, South Wales and Leicester, has a tribal tattoo on his left arm and one of a Celtic band on his left leg. Next over here is Cedric Brown, the 43-year-old. is wanted for attempted murder and aggravated burglary after a man was stabbed in front of his wife during a burglary at their home in Bristol last November. Brown, who's nicknamed Skipper, is from the West Midlands and may still be in that area. Number seven is Raja Majid Ali and he's wanted for a recall to prison after breaching the conditions of his licence. The 29-year-old was originally sentenced to 18 months in prison after stealing 23 grand from his former employers. Ali has both his ears pierced as links to Waltham Forest in London and Bristol and is known to use the name Majid Hussein. And finally, take a look at this. That is a 29-year-old Paolo Mendes using an iron bar to smash his way through the doors of a number N2 bus in Lambeth in South London last March. Mendes, who is Portuguese, has links to Lambeth, Brixton and Jersey. Police want to speak to this smashing chap urgently, so if you know where he is, call us now. It's the usual number for all of them, 0500 600 600, or you can text us, 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. And remember, all of them will stay online, which is bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch, until they're caught. Now, just after Christmas, 48-year-old father of two, Adrian Milner, was walking back from a festive drink at his local pub in Sittingbourne in Kent. But a single punch from a complete stranger meant he would never make it home. His family just can't understand why someone would do this. Whoever did it could have crossed over the road, walked past, whatever, and they didn't. They decided to land a punch, and that was the fatal blow. I feel cheated, if, if that's the right word to use. Cheated that someone would, would take him away when he made so many people so happy. I, I just can't comprehend that he should have died for that reason, for taking one punch in the face. And, you know, it, it's just a complete waste of a life. A complete waste of a life. Really awful. I'm uh, joined now by Detective Sergeant Richard Lejeune from Kent Police. Thanks for joining us, uh, Richard. It reminds us of the timing of this. It, was just, it happened just after Christmas. That's right. It was on the 28th of December last year, and Adrian had been out for the evening um, just having a festive drink. Shortly before 8pm, he left the pub and was walking home along Church Road in Sittingbourne. Yeah, and, I mean, there hadn't been any trouble in his evening up until then. As far as you know, this attack came out of nowhere. That's right. As far as we can tell, it was a totally unprovoked... A uh, very unpleasant attack. Um, enormous force was used and it shattered Adrian's nose and cheekbone. Really awful. Now, we've got important CCTV, so let's take a look at that and tell us what we're seeing here. This shows Adrian and his friends having left the pub walking along Church Road towards the co-op. Adrian, as you can see, is walking in the road on the left of the picture. Right. And shortly behind him is a man wearing a white baseball cap. Yeah, and we're just picking up this picture again. We will see the man with the white baseball cap. It actually... Here he is now. You know, there's something quite sinister about that, given, you know, what happened next. Ab absolutely. What we do know is that there was a lot of people out there that evening, either walking past or driving by or visiting the car. And what we would like is one of those people who probably saw the assault or saw the man wearing the baseball cap and recognised him to contact us this evening. Yeah, they might have been unaware that they were seeing something really important. They just thought it was a bit of a street fight. Exactly. And we've got other CCTV pictures, stills this time. And again, you're keen to talk to these two guys. That's right. This is from outside the co-op in Merston, slightly earlier in the evening, about ten past five. Right. Uh, and this still is from the Woodbury stores, which is close by. OK. Uh, now, it could be that they're showing the same people in both stills. Alternatively, they could be different. But in any case, we'd like them to come forward and contact us to rule them out the inquiry, basically. Yeah, they should come forward, or anyone who knows them should contact us uh, this yes. evening. Thanks for now, Richard. A terrible fate for a man who, as we saw, was just making his way home. Of course, it's been completely devastating for his family. 
Do you think you can help? Well, if you do, I would urge you to call this number. It's the usual one, 0500 600 600. Now, Rav's got some more of his criminals caught on camera. Yep, and we start inside the Santander Bank in Hatfield in Hertfordshire last August. It's just after midnight when two security guards making a cash delivery enter the bank in the town centre. As the second guard walks through the door, he's surprised by two attackers wielding a sledgehammer and a crowbar. While inside, they make a variety of threats and attack one guard with the hammer. They're violent and determined, eventually managing to make off with one of the cash boxes. But they aren't the smartest guys in town, as not only did they leave us with these lovely mugshots, the cash box they nicked was empty. Name these thwarted thieves tonight. A Friday afternoon in January in Mansfield, Nottinghamshire. A man in a hoodie swaggers into the newsagents and starts threatening the shopkeeper. The attacker was carrying some sort of weapon and forced the terrified woman to open the till. He managed to get away with the day's takings. Don't let him get away with daylight robbery. Tell us, who is this hooded hoodlum? Next inside Price's Jewellers Shop in Midsummer Norton in Somerset at the end of January. But this is more midsummer thieving than midsummer murders. A couple enter the shop and ask to look at some rings. Moments later, another woman wearing a red top comes in and then joins them. The three of them then set about what police think is a well-rehearsed con. The women try on the jewellery, while the man engages the shop assistant's attention by flashing his cash and asking a lot of questions. While the employee is distracted, the woman sees their chance. Watch here as the woman in red takes a ring and hides it in her hand. The three-pronged attack saw this thieving trio make off with seven items of jewellery worth well over a grand. And officers think this is the third shop in the town they've targeted, each time using the same routine. Help catch these sneaky thieves before they put on another of their scene-stealing performances. So if you recognise anyone, you know what to do. 0500 600 600, or you can text us on 63399, type crime, space, and then your message. OK, now it's uh, time for some more news on cases that you have already helped with. Yeah, and we start with the case we featured three years ago. 77-year-old grandmother Georgina Edmonds was found dead at her home in Hampshire in January 2008, having been tortured and beaten with a rolling pin. Well, last month, a 32-year-old man was charged with Mrs Edmonds' murder. He's due to stand trial later in the year. Now, next, you might remember this CCTV footage we showed you in January's programme of a man robbing a bookies in Porthcawl in South Wales. Well, you identified him as 28-year-old Nicholas James from Bridgend, and he was arrested in record time, just over an hour after the images were aired. And earlier this month, he was sentenced to two years and eight months in prison after admitting robbery. Great stuff. Right, thanks, Rav. Now we're going to go over to Matthew. He's got the latest on that big Caldwell burglary. Yeah, let's grab another word with Tim and his team. Uh, what else has come in? I think we've had about 20 calls since we last spoke. Um, emails and texts, some relating to names. But what I really want is more information with regards to the property. Um, we've talked about the bespoke necklace, the watches. We've actually got serial numbers for those watches, so they are identifiable. And very quickly, during the raid, they used a very... Odd phrase to Claire. Tell us quickly about that. Yeah, they, they use the phrase dimmy when the safe was open, which is not something that's the usual phrase for Staffordshire. It may be that it links to the Merseyside connections that we've identified. Okay, if you recognise that, do phone in. Tim, thanks very much. Raf. Now, we showed you some CCTV earlier that looked almost comical because of the way the landlord was dressed. There was nothing funny, though, about what happened when he was badly beaten by some customers in the pub. Lisa, you're running the investigation. How's the response so far? Um, we have had a call and we have got a possible name for the man in the white shirt, but obviously we're still keen for more information on, on both men. Yeah, and, of course, any witnesses that are there as well. Yes. Five o'clock, New Year's Day. If you were there, please do get in touch and tell us what you know. Kirsty. Thanks, Rav. Now, even if your skills are more ear guitar than lead guitar, it is uh, pretty obvious that these here are pretty special. We have got a vintage Fender Stratocaster and a Gibson 335, as well as a more recent Fender Telecaster. They're worth over £50,000 and they are almost identical to some of the 157 guitars that were stolen from a collector in Italy. 
In total, that haul was valued at around about a million quid. Many of the stolen instruments subsequently ended up in the UK, having been sold to unsuspecting uh, musicians. Well, now police are asking for your help to track them down. DC Chris Lord from uh, West Yorkshire Police is investigating this uh, sort of fascinating case, really. Tell me what happened. Yeah, these guitars were stolen in uh, Verona in Italy in 2006. Um, guitars have since been traced in various parts of the country, um, certainly in Leeds in particular. Right. Um, other guitars have been traced as far as field as Japan and the USA. Um, we've recovered a total of 32 guitars so far in the investigation. Okay. Tonight we are appealing for an outstanding 61 guitars. Um, uh, Chris, can you take me through? I mean, some of them are very interesting and some of them are very valuable. Indeed. P indeed. Pick out the important ones. Um, this one in particular is a 1952 Fender Telecaster. That's worth um, in excess of £40,000. This uh, Fender Stratocaster from 1958, that's a two-tone sunburst. That's worth in the region of £30,000 to £35,000. Wow. What about this little beauty here? This is a, a 1997 model Fender Stratocaster in sky blue. That's one of only 150 that was ever made. It was actually designed on behalf of Fender by our victim and that's worth in the region of £30,000. Now, you were telling me earlier today, I didn't know this, that guitars can get broken up like cars and parts of them used, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it could be a case where some of these guitars have been modified in an attempt to disguise their appearance. It, it could be the case where people, if they're not experts in this field, they could be purchasing guitars completely innocently. Yeah, I mean, it is quite important that if people have suspicions about their own guitars that they've bought legitimately, they think they should come to you. Yeah, certainly. We can certainly identify any guitars that don't belong to our victim. OK, Chris, for now, thanks very much indeed. Well, the details of all of those outstanding guitars are on our website. You might want to take a look at the details, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. If you've got any idea where any of them might be, I would urge you, please, are very valuable, as we saw. Call in on the usual number, 0500 600 600. Now, I think we have just got time for a final update on the phones. Do you know, I've got to tell you about the response we've had on the Sheffield school goal rate. We have had so many calls, lots of emails and texts. We've had 20 names and rising all the time in total. Two men have been named twice. Four names of particular interest to the local area are being checked out right now by the police team. So massive, massive response. And also, we've had uh, a witness that has come forward as well. It's so important to get the witness, someone who thinks they recognise the person wearing that blue hoodie. So absolutely fantastic. And I've just got time to tell you about one of the CCTV items, the Hertfordshire Gold Ring theft. We showed you uh, the, the, the chap there with the uh, distinctive hat. There he is. We've had two names that have been given already that the police are checking out. Both different, but one of them could be him. OK, that's everything for now. Details on all of tonight's cases are on our website, which actually this month also includes a special appeal from the Met Police. They are trying to identify ten men in relation to the violence that erupted after last year's FA Cup match between Chelsea and uh, Cardiff City. I think, uh, as we were hearing from Rav, it's been a pretty special night, quite a busy night behind us on the phones. But remember, of course, the lines do stay open until midnight tomorrow. Still plenty of time to call. We're going to be back in 35 minutes after the news with an update on all of tonight's cases. If you think you can help, if you know you can help, please do call. It makes a difference. Bye-bye for now.